would open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is where we're going to be. And uh, we're going to talk about good news. Amen. Something I'm pretty sure our world needs. Something I know I need. The soccer fan. And uh, 1 Thessalonians is filled with how you can live in good news. It's more of a passage where like, you can get a burst of inspiration from it. You can dive into it. There are these seven things that are clear commandments from God about what it means to walk with Christ. What it means to actually be a follower of Him. And uh, before we get into that, I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine uh, in college. His name was Kiyoki. And uh, Kiyoki was uh, from Hawaii. He was just an awesome dude. He kind of grew up in the tougher part of Hawaii. It wasn't like he was where all the tourists go. And the tougher part is full of crime. It's an inner city like anywhere else. And he grew up on those streets and it was a difficult journey. And he got to the place where he came to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. And his life turned around. And he came and he went to uh, Baptist Bible College. And he and I played basketball a lot together. Kiyoki had massive hands. Uh, and so when you saw him, it was one of those things that stood out. Like when he made a fist, it just felt like it was more than what should have been there. Think Popeye's forearm, but like all in the fist. That's kind of how Kiyoki was. And so we were playing basketball one day with another friend of ours whose name was Bud. And just if you go with the name Kiyoki and then you go with the name Bud, you kind of get the feeling they're different, right? Well, Bud was from Alabama. I, to this day, don't know what his real name is. Somewhere along the lines, people started calling him Bud, and it just stuck. So you got Kiyoki and Alabama, Alabama Bud, and then me and another guy on the court. And Kiyoki and I were on the same team, and we were destroying them. We were just playing two-on-two, two, and it was game after game after game that we were scoring, and we were winning. And they were playing more defense than offense, and it was just that kind of a, of a setting. And guys get competitive, girls get competitive, right? And so that began to happen, but in an unhealthy way between Kiyoki and Alabama Bud. And Bud began to try to get in Kiyoki's head by saying things to him. And then Kiyoki would just score on him. And it became fun for me to feed Kiyoki the ball and watch him score on trash talking Alabama Bud, right? I mean, it was just good Christians in a gymnasium playing the way Christ wanted us to play. And so after three or four more games, I don't know what Bud said. But he knew where Kiyoki was from. And he basically called him trash, but he did it in a way that cut into him. And what I remember is like, when you play basketball, a lot of times when you post up, if you have somebody behind you, you lean back into them, right? You lean into them to feel where they are and you get the ball. So he has the ball and he's leaning into them. Alabama Bud's down here. Okay, so you have the safety on the other side. And he's just trying to defend it and he said whatever he said. And Kiyoki drops the ball. I see his big like baseball glove bit do this. And as he turns, he clocks Alabama Bud in the nose, knocking him straight flat to the ground. Like I thought he was knocked out the way he fell to the ground. And it just happened all of a sudden, right? It's like basketball is just kind of slowly bouncing off the court and Kiyoki is standing over him with a fist. The guy he was playing with was one of his friends who comes rushing over and uh, Alabama Bud gets up to his knee, wipes and sees blood. I think we're going to leave him there for now and uh, just leave him on the ground with the nose and, and we'll come back. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five and let's read verses 14 and 15. Here's what it says. Now we exhort you brethren and immediately you would know that he is talking to Christians because of the familiarity of the term that he is using brethren, brothers and sisters. Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. We have a problem in our world, well, multiple problems in the world, but we have a problem in the world of Christianity. And the problem is, is there's too many people that are carrying the name Christian, and they are carrying God's name in vain. It's making no difference in their life. It's making no difference in their walk or their behavior. Maybe they do or don't come to church. But, but all that Christ is in their life is a ticket to heaven. And the behavior isn't changing. And the attitude isn't reflecting who Jesus would be. In fact, some of the worst sinners in this world claim the name Christian. And the reason I say they're worse is because if you're not a Christian, at least you're not telling the rest of the world that being a Christ follower is a hypocritical, worthless thing. 
I've had people say to me things like, well, I know Christians, and if they're getting into heaven, I'll get into heaven. And what are they doing? They're missing the mark. They're thinking behavior is what it's all about. I know this Christian that has horrible testimony, and if that person's getting into heaven, certainly I'm going to get into heaven. I'm nicer than they are. And so here we have this, this description being given, right? We have this, this high calling. Don't even render evil for evil. Even if someone does evil to you, don't render evil back to them. That's a high calling, isn't it? But followers of Christ are supposed to be that way. It's, it's why I don't even want to call this Christian behavior. I want to call it behavior of those who follow Jesus Christ. Who actually want to be like Him. And then you have these seven marvelous things. And yes, we're having abbreviated services. And I just announced to you that I had seven points. And we left poor Alabama butt on the floor. So we've got to keep going. Verse 16 is the first of those things. Very simply says, rejoice evermore. I just need to point a couple of things out about this idea. It is not saying to rejoice about everything. It is not telling you that no matter what comes your way, you have to put some sort of airy-fairy spin on it and make it into some good thing. God is the one that can make all things good. I don't have that power. There are things going on in our world I can't see good in it. I don't know how to make that good. I trust Him to do that. I don't believe we're called to rejoice for everything. We're called to always be able to rejoice. If nothing else, the fact that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, because that's who He's writing to, right? He's writing to people that understand that their sin would have sent them to hell, but because Jesus loved them enough to pay the price, they can go to heaven now, right? That's who He's, re that's who he's writing to. And so if you have Jesus as your Savior, no matter what else is happening in your life, you have a reason to rejoice every single day, every hour of every day, and every minute of that hour. We have something to rejoice about. So you will praise what you prize. I want to explain this just a bit before we move on. So this is not... Whatever you prize, like it or not, you're going to praise it. That's going to happen. Now I know there are people that kind of think of their Christian walk as like worshiping God is something we're commanded to do. And I really believe worshiping God is something that we just ought to do. We ought to prize Him so much that worshiping Him is just the normal thing to do. It's just the obvious thing. When something really good happens to me and I'm out in public, I say amen. It's just natural for me to say it. And it's amazing the reaction you get from people. Usually a positive thing, but it's just like, oh, you're a Christian because you said amen. I'll be careful. Just because they said amen doesn't mean that's the case. But you know what I'm saying? It's just natural to praise God. So what do you prize? If you prize uh, creative things and imagination and beautiful colors and, and awesome worlds, then you probably love video games that are like that, or you love movies that tell those tales, right? Star Wars and Star Trek that, that tell of the unknown, or, or the, the Lord of the Rings that, that shows this crazy world avatar that, that is a complete imaginative world. You, you probably love those things, and, and if you, you dial that down, it's because you love beauty, and you love colors, and you love adventure, and there's these things in your heart that it's just natural for you to praise. How do you praise it? You've watched that movie way too many times. I'm just going to call you out on it. I don't know what that movie is, but you have. If you prize food, you'll praise it. How do you know? Your belt buckle. Yes, ladies, I'm leaving you out of it. Guys, your belt buckle is how you know that. No, you know, right? I mean, I mean that's a thing that praise. some people praise uh, work because they prize work. Because work is aware that they can be significant and they can earn money. And maybe they also prize money. And so something in their chemical makeup makes them want to do that. People prize their family, so they praise their family. And they post pictures of their family everywhere. And I already have way too many pictures of my grandson in my phone. I think my pictures have doubled in like a day, right? Because what you, what you prize, you will praise. And the problem is, is that when the world goes wrong, if you're just prizing the thing, it turns into something bad. People will hide in their houses and watch movies or play video games all day long. Why? Because the world is falling apart, and that's what they praise. People will eat tubs of ice cream or a whole chocolate cake, right? There's a joke about that. Because when you prize food and things are not going well, you'll praise food. People become workaholics and ignore their family. And their whole life becomes about money and what they can have. Why? Because something's off. Darkness has come in in some way, shape, or form, and it's beginning to mess with you. I believe we need to magnify the Lord. When darkness comes, we should be remembering how good He is, 
We should be magnifying who He is. We, we should be tasting that the Lord is good. And so if you prize something and you recognize God is the one that made it, it will affect the way that you, you, you prize it. Like if you eat that ice cream, but you pray before you eat that ice cream or that chocolate cake, God, thank you this is here. I am stressed out. I'd love to have this. Maybe you'll get a leading that one small slice will do it. Maybe one scoop instead of the tub. All I'm saying is, is that if the thing you prize is because God is the giver of every good and every perfect gift, then when the darkness comes and you go to the automatic things that you praise and prize, when that's attached to God, it links to Him. Yes, you go for a walk, but it isn't the walk that makes you feel better. It's not creation that makes you feel better. It's that your Creator made that. And gave you the ability to have it. Yes, you go to work and, and you're driven and it pushes yourself. But you're working as if you're working unto the Lord. And then that allows you to rejoice evermore in whatever the thing is that you prize. And if you can't make the thing you prize about God, stop. Don't do it. Find something else to prize. Or pray and ask God to help you. So when the darkness comes, when you need to rejoice evermore and you're struggling, make it about the Lord. Remember who He is. Magnify who He is. Do something so you can taste and see that the Lord is good. And you're on that first step of what it really means to be a Christ follower from 1 Thessalonians 5. The next step is pray without ceasing. That feels like a tall order, doesn't it? Pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Maybe the monks have it right. On your hands and knees. Your wooden floor should have like those spaces where your knees are. I think it's awesome when people have that kind of discipline in prayer, but that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the constant conversation that you should have with God in your life as His child, right? Prayer can be, should be, a constant conversation that does what? Keeps you focused on His goodness. The, the verse is built here. In other words, if you do this verse well, it's because you're doing the verse before it well. If you're rejoicing ever more than when you go on that walk at some point in time, you're going to be like, God, thank you for fill in the blank. The birds that you love singing, the weather that's blowing just perfect, the trees or the water or the grass or whatever's around you, right? If you're in the middle of playing your most favorite video game, you will stop and say, God, thank you. You gave people wisdom to develop this and figure it out and create it. I'm thankful for this. A constant conversation is something every Christian ought to have. Every Christian ought to have this. Now, everybody's, everybody's different with conversation, but most of us have had the experience where we were talking to somebody and we felt like we could just keep talking to them forever. That is how our relationship with God should be. We should talk to them about our day, what's going on, the needs that are arising, things that are happening, the great song you just heard on the radio, the good thing that happened at work, the bad thing that happened that you're asking them to help you out with. When you create a prayer without ceasing life, that constant conversation with God, it will fuel your ability to rejoice evermore. It'll allow you to be that kind of a follower. I like being around people who are happy people. I don't expect them to be happy at a funeral when someone they love dies. I'm not talking about that. I just mean people that in general are happy people that rejoice evermore. We were talking this morning before worship started and one of our members said that they were a willful optimist. I just love that expression. What does it mean? I'm an optimist, but I go kicking and screaming in order to be an optimist. Everything in me wants to be negative and wants to go that way, but something in me is saying, hey, don't go that way. I think that's a great choice to make in life. And I don't see how you have that if you don't have a constant conversation with God. Too many things happen too often. Maybe you just don't watch the news. Maybe you don't own a TV or a phone or a computer. Bless your heart if that's you. But most of us on a daily basis are being fed something else. So on an even dailier basis, we need this constant conversation. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing so you can keep your focus on His goodness. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. Not for everything. Like it's so important to break verses like this down. I've heard people say, well, as a Christian, you should thank God for everything. No, I thank God that God is God even though everything happens. But there are things you don't thank for, right? There are things going on that, yes, God can work it for good, but it was not God that did it. It's the sinful world we live in. It's that Satan and his minions are out there trying to destroy and divide. And it's that people are capable of evil acts. You don't thank for the evil act, right? But it does say in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God 
in, in Christ Jesus. It's the will of God for you in Jesus Christ. In other words, when you interpret things from an eternal perspective, that's when you're able to do this. So I have this little phrase here with the not for everything, but in everything. Decisions determine direction. And direction determines your spiritual death. Right? Decisions determine direction. And direction determines your spiritual death. So we need deep roots when George Floyd is killed on the street. We need deep roots when the world shuts down because of COVID. We need deep roots for whatever the next thing is. We need roots that are digging down deep to be who God wants us to be in that time. Because what the world really needs is Jesus. And they need Christians who actually look like Jesus. Who are so in tune with God of rejoicing evermore and praying without ceasing. They're doing that so often that they can show Christ to the rest of the world. And then in that you can give thanks. God, thanks for the wisdom of this conversation with someone. God, thank you for helping me to make a social post where I actually consider what people will think of this. Thank you for helping me be who you want me to be. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to show Jesus to people who are hurting in our world. Thank you that you've taught me to give up my own rights so that I can do things for other people instead of living a self-focused life. We can give thanks in everything, even when we can't give thanks for everything. And there's a lot of stuff that's praiseworthy. That's the whole first verse. But I really think the reason this is repeated or, or, or it comes across this way, or God goes so far to say, this is my will for you. This is something that I absolutely want everyone in Christ to do, is to find a way of giving thanks in everything, is because he expects us to walk like him. We say it here and we know it's true, right? You... You literally have to understand that there is nothing else that is the hope of the world but the local church. Because the local church carries the gospel. And the gospel is the hope of the world. Jesus is that hope. The government's not going to fix it. They're not going to come up with enough laws or enough solutions and make everyone happy. That's not what's going to happen in our world. But the more people who are turned to Jesus Christ, the more opportunity we'll have to see what it looks like to be in a world that he rules. I mean, one day he will, right? And until that, it's not going to happen. But what happens in an individual person's life, it could change an entire community. And we're going to come back to that, but I just want you to know the decisions you're making determine your direction. And it isn't perfection, it's direction that determines your spiritual death. The direction you're headed. If you think that has to be perfection, somewhere along the lines, you'll do something and think you can't be a good Christian anymore. And it'll derail your spiritual life. That's not the truth. You failed yesterday, well then get back up on the horse and start serving God today. You're struggling with something in your life, give it to Him and make sure He's the owner of it. How do I give it to Him? Talk to Him about it all day. I talk to Him about stuff all day, every day. What will that do? It allow me to focus on the goodness of God and I can rejoice evermore, regardless of what else is happening around me, because I know how good God is. Alright, we got to keep moving. Thanks for listening fast. Continue to do that, please. Verse 19 says, quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Holy Spirit of God. I think it's good to, to just go inside for a second and ask the question, what do you do when the Holy Spirit lights a fire in you? You're at the grocery store and you feel like you're supposed to pay for the person behind you. Do you look to make sure they don't have too many groceries? You know? Well, what if they're buying alcohol? I don't even know if they're buying alcohol. I can't buy that alcohol for them. What do you do when the Holy Spirit leads you to talk to somebody at a gas pump and you don't know them? What do you do when the Holy Spirit leads you to invite somebody to a church service? When the Holy Spirit invites you to invite someone to look online? What do you do when you're in the middle of saying what you want to say and the Holy Spirit slaps you and you realize you shouldn't be saying what you're saying? How do you respond when the Holy Spirit lights a fire in you? This is not a secret. If you're a Christian, you should be experiencing this all the time. If you could honestly say to me that in the last week you didn't feel one nudge from the Holy Spirit, I am so worried about your spiritual life. What is going on in your life when you're so out of tune with God that He isn't nudging you? Because I don't believe the problem in our world is that there aren't enough voices coming from God telling Christians what to do. There's not enough Christians bold enough to listen to what God is saying. He hasn't stopped. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is waiting to come back in this world. He's waiting to come back and end all the garbage because there's still people out there left to get saved. That's His reason. And all the other things that are beyond us, right? So what do you do when the Holy Spirit lights a fire? Can I advise you to put down your water bottle? 
I don't know what your water bucket is, but put it down. I mean, your water bucket might be one of those things that we prize, right? Maybe your water bucket is the TV. Maybe your water bucket is to go talk to somebody else. Maybe your water bucket is just to finish your reading, finish your prayer, and not do anything else. Go on with your day. Go to the next thing. Maybe your water bucket is it's the middle of the night, and he's talking to you as you pray before you go to sleep. You're like, you know what? If God wants me to do it, he'll tell me in the morning. I'm not going to write it down. I'm not going to send myself a text that I think God's talking to me. That's weird. I might wake up. I mean, what's your water bucket? What do you do to douse it? We all have it. Let's not be prideful. We all have these messages from the Holy Spirit that at times we're not willing to listen to. Why? Because we want what we want. What's your water about it? Put it down. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks. Quench not the Spirit. I don't know how you won't quench the Spirit if you're not talking to God every day. Because if you're not talking to God every day, I mean, if that isn't the regular thing that you're doing with your life, how do you rejoice? How do you rejoice in times like these? Are you surprised at all that people that you're going to go work with tomorrow will probably be depressed when they come in? Or angry? Or both? I mean, it shouldn't surprise us. It doesn't surprise me when I see something on news, whatever it is. I mean, I mean no matter what uniform they're wearing, no matter what color their skin is, people live as sinners when they are not Christian. When they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I think it's important for us to look out there sometimes and recognize, you know what, whatever evil I see out there, I'm capable of that. What keeps me from doing it? Maybe I want to do the same thing, but am I better than anyone else? Or is God in me better than someone else? And so there's this pattern that if you rejoice evermore, maybe you should start praying without ceasing, because if you do that in everything, you can give thanks, not for everything, but in everything, and you'll stop quenching the spirit in your life, and you won't despise prophesying. Despise not prophesying. And yes, that looks like it's spelled wrong, but that's the King's English. I think we should honor it once in a while. If you don't understand what we're talking about, look in your KJV Bible and you'll see why it is spelled that way. This literally doesn't just mean to don't despise preaching. Preaching is included in this. Truth is included in this. But if you look in other modern translations, the Greek word here is prophesying. Prophetic teaching. Talking about what God is going to do. In our world, He's going to do things. And then He's going to return and come back and get us. And that's kind of kooky to people who don't understand what it means that Jesus is coming back. He's going to appear in the sky. He's going to teleport you up to Him. The whole world is just basically going to fall apart for seven years. And then He's coming back. Yup. Exactly what's going to happen. You think you're just going to fly out of the building one day? Yup. I hope I make a hole. I mean, I don't know if it'll be that way or not, but it'd be cool. It'd be a bunch of holes in our ceiling. People come in. I think it'd be cool if, like, our clothes just fell and you immediately became whatever you're going to be changed. It says you'll be changed in an instant in the twinkling of your eye. So if your clothing is just changed, then maybe not. But if your clothing isn't changed, how cool would it be? To come into a church building, you're trying to figure out what's going on. You're one of those people that's going to get saved during the tribulation, right? And you see a pair of braces and teenage clothes sitting on pew. I, don't, I mean, if it works that way, the braces aren't going to go. You see an older gentleman's clothing. Maybe you smell his old spice that he was wearing. And his knee replacement is sitting there on the ground. Like, I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. I just know it is bizarre to people that don't understand it. But that should not keep us from being excited about it. Despise not prophesies. Look, I know this is going to be redundant. Truth is always true doesn't matter whether people believe it or not. Our world has moved away from this. Your truth is what matters. Just whatever you believe. And you better be so careful to speak the truth in love. That is needed more in this world than it's ever been needed. For one, because you can speak with such a louder voice. So many more people can hear you than you realize. But truth is always true. So let the Spirit move. How do you not despise the prophesying? Don't quench the spirit and you won't despise it. How do you not quench the spirit? And everything give thanks. How do you give thanks for everything? Pray without ceasing. Why would I pray without ceasing? Because you're rejoicing evermore. I mean, it's a pattern. The next verse says, prove all things. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is true. In other words, knowing what is true is on you. It's not even on me. Like, you will not stand before God and say, Pastor Beeler said this. Wow. He said, Pastor Beeler. I don't know if I've said that before. I feel like my dad just became a pastor. Pastor Granddaddy-o. 
John said this to me, so it had to be true. Don't ever think that. Not that way. You are accountable to prove that all things are true. And I'm, of course, going to do, teach the truth. I, I want to teach the truth. I study hard to teach the truth. You should have people that you can trust their voice in your life. But when you stand before God, He's going to expect that you proved all things. And that you held fast to what was true. And if you despise teaching, you'll find someone that says what you want them to say, and that's who you'll congregate around. All right, verse, verse 21, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. How in the world, with riots and COVID-19 and murders and masks and whatever's next, how in the world are you going to abstain from all appearance of evil? Because how you react to the things going on in our world could be evil. You might act in rage. You might speak before thinking. You might not love your neighbor. You might not have the perspective they have. You might judge something wrong. It'd be very easy to fall into evil nowadays, right? All these different behaviors that we can do that would be interpreted as evil. This is not telling you to go around and find out what might offend everyone else and then make sure you don't do it. Right? You're going to disappoint someone. Not everyone's going to like you. There is no way you're going to live in this world and in this life and please everyone around you. That's a recipe for disaster. And that's not what you're commanded here. This is the word of God telling you to abstain from appearance of evil. Of what God says is evil. How are you going to figure that out? Well, I think you're going to have to prove all things. You're going to have to find out whether the Bible says you can or can't have a tattoo. I believe it says you can. And I have no issue with tattoos. There are people out there that do. I need to prove that from the Word of God. I need to get into the book and know what it says I should or I should not do. And if I am not proving all things, how will I avoid the appearance of evil? Eventually, I'm probably going to step in. Well, how do you prove all things? Despise not prophesying. Hear it. Teach it. Learn it. Quench not the Spirit. And everything it thinks. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice evermore. So poor Alabama bud is on the ground. Bloody nose. And I'm not lying to you. Kiyoki had both fists clutched. And Alabama Bud is down here and gets up to his knees where his head is here and Kiyoki is literally not far away. Both fists. Just expecting that this is going to turn into a big brawl. I think Kiyoki could have killed him if he wanted to. Like I, Just the way he hit and his hard of a punch as he had this massive enough, I think if it would have turned into a horrible fight. So I'm running to dive on the Kiyoki because he's the guy I know best, right? And Bud's friend, Bud's buddy, is coming to dive on Bud and we're just going to stop this you know, fight from happening. And as he's doing this, Alabama Bud wipes his nose and puts his hand up. Can I get a hand up? Kiyoki goes, Right? He's like, yeah, I'll help you out. I'm, I'm cocked and ready. You. Just want you to know. And Bud goes, dude, that was a solid hit. I shouldn't have said that. Wipe the blood from his nose again. Kiyoki's fist kind of undid. And he goes, yeah, there's no way I should have hit you, dude. I'm so sorry. I thought I put that behind me when I got saved. They hugged it out. And then we finished playing basketball. And Kiyoki and I continued to destroy them. <laughs> you know, the verses in front of this say, don't render evil for evil. I think we're going to need to learn that better and better in our world. And that's not easy. How in the world are you going to be Alabama above? How are you going to get hit in the face like that and then stand up and forgive the guy that did it before he even apologizes? I mean, because he did it, because that was his attitude, they became better friends as a result of that crazy day on the basketball court, right? So it would be hard for me not to speak about... Um, George Floyd. So as we conclude, I want to do that, but the big seven that you see here in 1 Thessalonians 5 is a special kind of follower of Christ. Not a lot of Christians are living these seven things, but what it turns you into when you live these seven things is what our world really needs. People who actually look like Jesus. Not someone who says they're a Christian, one that actually looks like Him. That's what we need. So if you don't know about George Floyd, if you haven't been paying attention, African-American man, about 6'6", he was in handcuffs, and it was video that he was placed on concrete ground 
And the officer that was over him, a white police officer, has a knee on his neck, kept it there for eight something minutes, and he suffocated and died. As this was occurring, his cuffs were behind him, and the other two police officers that were there, two of them had knees on his legs to keep him from getting up. One stood and watched it happen. It's an absolute tragedy. I'm a white man. I don't know what it is like to have to like teach my son because of what I have seen in this world. Hey dude, because of the color of your skin, when you get pulled over, you might need to be more careful than some people need to be. I don't know what that's like. How could I possibly speak to whether it's an act that, that is this or that or the other when I don't live that? I want to listen to my brothers and sisters who do know what it's like to live that. I want to love them. I want to say the right words. And I don't want to judge people who are angry and, and protesting and so many, well, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? I just don't know that that's the Christian walk. Maybe you should actually try to find out. Why are people so angry? Why is there this rage that's flowing through? Maybe there's a hurt they have that you don't understand. Maybe you need to love on them. That cop that did this does deserve to be arrested and he does deserve to go to jail. He killed someone. That cop needs Jesus. Those other cops need Jesus. And the people on the streets that are rioting need Jesus. And I need Jesus. I don't know anyone that doesn't need Jesus. Can I tell you some good news? George Floyd knew Jesus Christ as his Savior. George Floyd held the mission work in Houston, Texas. It's called Resurrection Houston. And he was actively involved in it. He has a testimony of knowing Christ as Savior. It doesn't make what happened right at all. But it sure changes the story to know that he's in heaven right now. It gives some hope into the story. Don't use that to excuse it, right? Like that's the worst thing you could do. Well, it doesn't matter because he was a Christian. No, because the next guy might not be. Mm. To even know how to handle the things that are coming our way that are happening day after day. Because the next thing, who knows if you'll be able to find that out or not. All I know is that no matter who they are, everyone matters to God equally. God doesn't see gender. The Bible says it doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Greek. It doesn't matter whether you're educated or not. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. All of us need Jesus, and Jesus loves all of us equally. But for us to think that there aren't injustices going on in the world for people just because of how they look or who they are, those are happening. Be sensitive. Be nice. Be kind. Don't speak unless you believe Jesus Christ himself would say the exact words you're saying. Then just pray. Just be kind. Just offer sympathy. Just try to come alongside your neighbor and love them. How are you going to do that for the next thing that we are not prepared for? Well, if you're rejoicing evermore, you're praying without ceasing, and in everything you're giving thanks, so you're not quenching the Spirit, and you're not despising prophesying, and you're proving all things and holding on to the stuff that is true, it'll allow you to abstain from all appearance of evil. You can be a Christian that isn't all about themselves, but is actually trying to look like Jesus in this world that desperately needs it. Would you stand your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning?